lesson this morning comes from Luke 18, chapters 35 through 43. I'll be reading from the King James Version. Luke 18, 35 through 43. And it came to pass, as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What will thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave him praise unto God. You've been reading the Bible and have a scripture hit you right between the eyes. Doesn't matter how many times you've read it, doesn't matter how many times you've read over it, doesn't matter how many times you've overlooked it. You read it that time and it hits you. Doesn't matter if you've taught the book, doesn't matter if it's the first time you've ever read it. It just gets you. First Corinthians ten thirty one did me like that in the recent past. And it says this. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now let that sink in just for a second. Because if we would ponder on that scripture, it has the ability to change our lives for the better. But you know what we have to do? We have to implement 1 Corinthians 10 31 before we act. That is, before we say or do anything, we should simply ask ourselves this question. Is what I'm about to do or what I'm about to say going to bring glory to God? Is this going to glorify God? And if the scriptural answer to that is yes, then do it. But if the scriptural answer to that is no, we would make our lives a whole lot easier if we would have the attitude of, will this glorify God? Again, if the scriptural answer is yes, then do it. But if the scriptural answer is no, don't. What does glorifying God mean? How do we scripturally glorify God? Well, here's a simple and as accurate of an answer as I can provide. What does it mean to glorify God? How do we give God the glory? It means to recognize God as sovereign and live accordingly. Meaning, God is God, and in view of the fact that God is God, we live our lives accordingly. Meaning that we know that we're going to have to give account to God for the things that we've said, the things that we've done. And wouldn't it be so much simpler and so much easier if we glorify God from the beginning instead of making a mess and then say, how do I clean this up? That's what we need to think about, friend and brethren. Glorifying God results from hearts filled with appreciation for what God has done, amazement for what God is doing now, and a calm assurance knowing that God will continue to do right. So let's talk today about glorifying God. We want to suggest three things today. Here's the first one. We glorify God through our speech. Now we should verbally give credit where credit is due. Do you think the Bible teaches that? Well, it does. Let me remind you of James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So James 1.17 makes it clear that every good thing in our lives 
is due to the benevolence of Jehovah God Almighty. So how should we talk about the Godhead? If we're going to open our mouth about God, how should we speak of God? Well, should we curse God and die? No. Should we blaspheme His holy and righteous name? No. That's, that's not right. We know better than that, don't we? We know that we don't glorify God by speaking evil or blaspheming the name of God. We know better than that. But are we aware that all our words, whether they're in reference to God or whether they're in reference to anyone else, ought to bring glory to God? Everything that comes out of our mouths should do what? It should glorify God. You're aware that in Matthew 12, 33 through 37, Jesus clearly confirms that our words are a reflection of our hearts. And we know the Bible heart is the mind. The mind is the seat of mankind's emotions. Jesus said, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified. And by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now it's generally true that old habits die hard. No, say, old habits die hard, meaning that the words we used while we were lost sinners without hope in the world don't just poof away when we become children of God. However, with God's help, all things are possible. Do we really believe that? With God's help, all things are possible. Meaning that old mouth can change, can't it? You know what the secret to the mouth is? The mind. So when our minds are renewed, our mouths can't help but follow. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 20, Luke chapter 5 and verse 25, and what was our scripture reading? In Luke 18 and verse 43, all those scriptures contain the words glorifying and God. And if you go back and read all those in the respective contexts, the strong implication is that all these respective people spoke true words of appreciation to God. Therefore, it is scriptural to say that we can and we must glorify God by our speech. Meaning what? We give God the credit He is due. How do we live, move, have our very being? Acts 17 says it's by God. So should we glorify God by our speech? The answer is clearly yes. Now let me give you some practical advice. Practical advice. Preacherly advice. Instead of constantly complaining, let's attempt to give God the credit for everything good, positive, and beneficial in our lives. Now it may take some time. It doesn't, it's not like an on-off switch. You can't just cut it on and off. So it will take some time. But with diligence, our hearts, our minds, in other words, our brains, can be rewired to see and appreciate the positive. Philippians 4, 6 through 8, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Don't you see that we can and should and must glorify God through our speech? Well, let's move on. Second, we glorify God through our service. You know, Romans 12, 1 is still in the Bible. And it still says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So that scripture makes it clear that every Christian must offer an ongoing and perpetual service to God. Well, what does the verse say that it is? The sacrifice of our bodies. Now, we don't go out and 
lay on the altar and keep murder ourselves. That's not what it's talking about. But what does it mean? Bodies implies the whole of man, every fiber of our being, physically, spiritually, emotionally, all of it. We must, therefore, sacrifice our will to his ways. Now, despite numerous new versions of the English Bible, specifically rewriting the last word of Romans 12, 1 to say worship, that's not correct. It's service. All of life is not worship. However, you are aware that you are in a worship assembly right now. So let me give you a true statement. All worship is service, but not all service is worship. You understand that? All true worship is true service, but not all service to God is worship. Now, are you aware that we should glorify God by our worship? John 4, 23 and 24, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we glorify God through our worship, and worship is a form of service, but not all service is worship. Now our daily walk with God should also bring glory to God. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 10, 31? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So our daily lives should reflect glory to God, should it not? Now, we cannot overstress statements like 1 Corinthians 10, 31, especially in view of our day-to-day -day existence. But I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 3. And Colossians chapter 3 is an excellent, excellent chapter to deeply ponder with regard to Christian service. You say, well, I'm a member of the Lord's church. What do I do now? Read Colossians chapter 3. That's a pretty good chapter to look at. So let me give you some practical advice. Let's do what Colossians 3, 12 to 15 teaches and let's do what Colossians 3 18 to 21 teach all right look at what the Bible says is this bringing glory to God well let's see Colossians 3 and verse 12 put on therefore as the elect of God holy and beloved bowels of mercies does that bring glory to God yes kindness does that bring glory to God yes humbleness of mind does that bring glory to God yes meekness long-suffering forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Does that bring glory to God? Yes. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also, what does he say? He says, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, love, which is the bond of perfectness. It's the glue of so to speak, which holds all things together. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in how many bodies? One body. And be ye thankful. Now, same chapter. We could say a lot about verse 16 and 17, but look at verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now, what happens when a wife does that? Does that degrade her? Is that demeaning to her? No. That brings glory to God. Because this is what God teaches us to do. Likewise, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Does that demean or degrade the husband to love his wife? No. It brings glory to God. Verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well pleasing unto the Lord. So when parents tell their children what the Lord expects of them and the children obey it, what does that do? That brings glory to God. Verse 21, fathers, provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. Now that's a negative. Don't do this. So when we do not do this, what does that do? It brings glory to God. Don't you see that we glorify God through our service? Well, that's one third. We glorify God through our submission. Now speech is one thing, isn't it? Service is another. We, 
We understand that. But really, what do those things boil down to? They boil down to submission. Many individuals in our land freely profess the Bible to be the inspired Word of God, do they not? Yes. Those same individuals, many of them, profess that Jesus of Nazareth is the only Savior of mankind, do they not? Yes, they do. But instead of submitting to the righteousness of God, they seek to form or establish their own form of righteousness. Let me prove that to you. Look in the book of Romans. Look in Romans 10. We'll spend a little time here in the book of Romans. But look at Romans chapter 10 beginning in verse 1. Many of the first century Jews had this exact problem. They understood. God had spoken to man. And these men were inspired by the Holy Spirit and wrote it in a book. Definitely they had no problem with the Old Testament. They understood to some degree that the Messiah was coming. Now they had a problem with it being Jesus. But they understood that that concept was there. Now with that in mind, look at Romans 10 and verse 1. Brethren, this is the Apostle Paul speaking by inspiration. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, that's fleshly Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is that they might be saved. Well, saved from what? Saved from their sins. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Isn't that how our religious friends are? Do they have a zeal for God? Listen, they're doing something similar to what we're doing right now. They have a zeal for God. That is undeniable, but not according to knowledge. They're going, so to speak, wide open in the name of religion, but that zeal is not based upon knowledge. Why? Because they have not submitted unto the righteousness of God. Verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Now this book, that is the book of Romans, has made it clear in chapter 1, which we'll go to in just a second, that the righteousness, the right doing of God is now revealed in the gospel. It's not in the law of Moses. It's in the gospel. For they being ignorant, the implication is willfully ignorant, of God's righteousness and going about to establish, what does he say? Their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Do you see the key word there? It's submitted. We can go with all the zeal that we have. We can go with all of, all of what we want to do. But until we submit to the righteousness of God, we're in trouble. Don't we see that? Now, the book of Romans is about the righteousness of God. Let me prove it. Turn in chapter 1. Every book of the Bible has a theme. So if you want to really boil down Romans, ask yourself this. How, how do I get right with God? Well, read the book of Romans. Read the book of Romans and you'll see how to get right with God. And it's very simple. You need to be in the gospel. You need to be in Christ. Romans 1, 16 and 17 gives, so to speak, the thesis statement for the entire book. Now, the righteousness of God is now fully revealed in the gospel, the New Testament, Matthew to Revelation. The first three chapters of Romans demonstrate the need of the gospel. As we'll look at quickly in chapter 1, it seems that the Gentiles need the gospel. Chapter 2, the Jews need the gospel. And then the obvious conclusion in chapter 3, all need the gospel. So let's briefly consider Romans 1, 20 and 21. And it seems to me that this is in reference to the ancient Gentiles. Even if it's not, it applies to human beings. So look what humans could and can still do. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Meaning that God has given us evidence of himself. Being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. Because that. Now look, look at this. Look at this and ask yourself about glorifying God. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Now these people understood, didn't they? Yeah. 
These people were without excuse. There was no excuse for their conduct. They knew the true God, didn't they? Yes. And due to them not glorifying God as God, and because they were not thankful to God for being God, they became vain in their imaginations. God said, you want to be crazy? Be crazy. Believe whatever you want to believe. And their foolish heart was darkened. So let me give you the most practical advice I've ever given anybody or that you could really ever get from anyone. Submit to the righteousness of God now. Because if you do not, wrath and vengeance awaits. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now how much plainer can that be stated? If we're not going to glorify God by allowing him to add us to his church, hell literally awaits. And now is that plain? You know, the church is to glorify God according to Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. And the truth is, we glorify God by our speech, by our service, and truly by our submission to him. You ever had a scripture hit you right between the eyes? 1 Corinthians 10, 31 hit me right between the eyes when you really begin to think about it. You know what's the truth though? The longer we listen, the longer we read, the longer we study, the more every one of them hits home. Sooner or later, the gospel will come knocking on your door. And either we're going to open that door or we're going to keep that door closed and that door is obviously our heart. Either we're going to be receptive to God's word or we won't. You know, Jesus died for you and Jesus died for me. And in view of that, are we willing to do what he says? Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I didn't say that. Jesus did. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 16. What must I do to be right with God? Hear the truth. Acts 18, 8. Believe the truth. Acts 16, 31. Repent of sin. Acts 17, 30. Confess openly and freely that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Then we've been added by the Lord to the church, and brethren, it's up to us. We have to be faithful unto death. Part of that is through obedience to Acts 8.22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God. If perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Wherever you are, come now. As together we stand as we sing the song of encouragement.